Hello, my darling, and welcome back. I thought for tonight that I would do a bedtime story for you with a little fire in the background. Today's story is Beauty and the Beast. It was written by Marie Le Prince de Beaumont in 17... 56, and the original title was Beauty and the Beast, a tale for the entertainment of juvenile readers. But I definitely think it's a story that we can all enjoy. So lie back, close your eyes, and enjoy the fire while I read to you. There was once a very rich merchant who had six children, three sons, and three daughters. Being a man of sense, he spared no cost for their education and gave them all kinds of masters. His daughters were extremely beautiful, especially the youngest. When she was little, everybody admired her and called her the little beauty. As she grew up, she still went by the name of Beauty, which made her sisters very jealous. The youngest, as she was beautiful, was also better than her sisters. The two eldest had a great deal of pride because they were rich. They gave themselves ridiculous airs and they would not visit other merchants' daughters, nor would they keep company with any but persons of quality. They went out every day to parties of pleasure, balls, plays, concerts, and they would laugh at their youngest sister because she spent the greatest part of her time reading books. As it was known that they were to have great fortunes Several eminent merchants made their address to them, but the two eldest said they would never marry, unless they could meet a duke, or an earl at least. Beauty very civilly thanked them, all of the men that courted her, and told them that she was too young to marry, and she chose to stay with her father for a few years longer. But then... All at once, the merchant lost his whole fortune, except for a small country house a great distance from town. He told his daughters, with tears in his eyes, they must go there and work for their living. The two eldest answered that they would not leave the town, for they had several lovers, and they were sure they would be taken in even though they had lost their fortune. But in this, they were mistaken, for their lovers slighted and forsook them in their poverty. As they were not beloved on account of their pride, everybody said, They do not deserve to be pitied. We are glad to see their pride humbled. Let them go and give themselves quality airs by milking cows and minding their dairy. But the townspeople were very concerned for beauty. She was such a charming, sweet-tempered creature. She spoke so kindly to poor people, and was of such an affable, obliging disposition. In fact, several gentlemen would have married her, though they knew she had not a penny to her name. But she told them, that she could not think of leaving her poor father in his misfortunes. Beauty was determined to go along with him into the country to comfort and attend to him. Poor Beauty at first was sadly grieved at the loss of their fortune, but she said to herself, Were I to ever cry so much, that would not make things better. I must try instead to make myself happy without a fortune. When they arrived at their country house, the merchant and his three sons 
applied themselves to husbandry and tillage, and beauty rose at four in the morning and made haste to have the house clean and breakfast ready for the family every day. In the beginning, she found it very difficult, for she had not been used to work as a servant, but in less than two months she grew stronger and healthier than ever. After she was finished with her work, she read, played on the harpist cord, or else sung whilst she spun. On the contrary, her two sisters did not know how to spend their time. They got up at ten, and did nothing but saunter about the whole day, lamenting the loss of their fine clothes and acquaintance. Do but see our youngest sister, said they one to the other. What a poor, stupid, mean-spirited creature she is. How can she be contented with such an unhappy situation? The good merchant was of a quite different opinion. He knew very well that beauty outshone her sisters in her person as well as her mind. He also admired her humility, industry, and patience, for her sisters not only left all of the work of the house to do, but insulted her at every moment. The family had lived about a year in this retirement when the merchant received a letter. In it was an account that a vessel, on board of which he had effects, and it had safely arrived. This news had liked to have turned the heads of the two eldest daughters, and they immediately flattered themselves with the hopes of returning to town, for they were quite weary of a country life. When they saw their father ready to set out, they begged of him to buy them new gowns, caps, rings, and all manner of trifles. But Beauty asked for nothing. She thought to herself that all the money her father was going to receive would scarce be sufficient to purchase everything her sisters wanted. What will you have, Beauty? said her father. Since you are so kind as to think of me, answered she, be so kind as to bring me a rose. For as none grow hereabouts, they are a kind of rarity. Not that Beauty cared for a rose, but she asked for something, lest she should seem by her example to condemn her sister's conduct. Of course, they would have said she did it only to look particular. The good man went on his journey, but when he came there, they went to law with him about the merchandise and after a great deal of trouble and pains to no purpose, he came back as poor as before. He was within thirty miles of his own house, thinking on the pleasure he should have in seeing his children again, when going through a large forest, he lost himself. It rained and snowed terribly, and the wind was so strong that it threw him twice off his horse, and night coming on, he began to apprehend being either starved to death with cold and hunger, or else devoured by the wolves, whom he heard howling all around him. All of a sudden, looking through a long walk of trees, he saw some light in the distance. Going a little farther, he perceived it to come from a place illuminated from top to bottom. The merchant thanked God for his happy discovery, and hastened to the palace. But he was greatly surprised at not meeting with anyone who might have lived there. His horse followed him. Seeing a large stable open, they went inside. They found hay and oats, and the poor beast, who was almost famished, fell to eating heartily. The merchant tied up his horse on the manger and walked towards the house. He saw no one, but he entered into a large hall. He found a good fire, and he found a table plentifully set out, but there was only one cover laid. As he was wet, 
quite through with the rain and snow. He drew near the fire to dry himself. He looked around the room. I hope, said he, that the master of the house or his servants will excuse the liberty I take. I suppose it will not be long before someone appears. He waited a considerable time until the clock struck eleven and still no one came. At last he was so hungry that he could stay no longer. So he took a chicken from the table and ate it in two mouthfuls, trembling all the while. After this, he drank a few glasses of wine, and growing more courageous, he went out of the hall and crossed through several grand apartments with magnificent furniture. Eventually he came into a chamber which had an exceedingly good bed in it, and as he was very much fatigued and it was well past midnight, he concluded it might be best to shut the door and go to bed. It was ten in the morning before the merchant awoke, and as he was going to rise, he was astonished to see a good suit of clothes in the room of his own, which were quite spoiled. Certainly, said he, this palace belongs to some kind of fairy, who has seen and pitied my dirtiness. He looked through a window, but instead of snow saw the most delightful arbors. They were interwoven the most beautiful flowers that he had ever beheld. He then returned to the great hall, where he had supped the night before, and found some chocolate ready-made on a little table. Thank you, good Madam Fairy, said he aloud, for being so careful as to provide me a breakfast. I am extremely obligated to you for all of your favors. The good man drank his chocolate and then went to look for his horse. But as he passed through an arbor of roses, he remembered Beauty's request to him, and he gathered a branch on which were several. But immediately he heard a great noise and saw a frightful beast coming towards him. He was ready to faint away. You are very ungrateful, said the beast to him in a terrible voice. I have saved your life by receiving you into my castle, and in return, you steal my roses, which I value beyond anything in the universe, and you shall die for this. I give you but a quarter of an hour to prepare yourself to say your prayers. The merchant fell on his knees, and he lifted up both of his hands. My lord, said he, I beseech you to forgive me. Indeed, I had no intention to offend in gathering a rose for one of my daughters. She only desired me to bring her one. The monster replied, My name is not my lord, but beast. I do not love compliments. I prefer that people should speak as they think. So do not imagine I am to be moved by any of your flattering speeches but you say you have daughters. I will forgive you, on condition that one of them would willingly come and suffer for you. Let me have no words, but go about your business, and swear that if your daughter refuses to die in your stead, you will return in three months. The merchant had no mind to sacrifice his daughters to this ugly monster, but he thought, in obtaining this request, he should have the satisfaction of seeing them once more. He promised upon oath that he would return. The beast told him that he might set out when he pleased, but, added the beast, you shall not depart empty-handed. Go back to the room where you lay, and you will see a great empty chest. Fill it with whatever you like. And I will send it to your home. And at this time, the beast withdrew. Well, said the good man to himself, if I must die, I shall have comfort at least of leaving something to my poor children. He returned to the bedchamber, and finding a great quantity of broad pieces of gold, 
He filled the great chest the beast had mentioned. He locked it, and afterwards took his horse out of the stable, leaving the palace with as much grief as he had entered it with joy. The horse, of his own accord, took one of the roads of the forest, and in a few hours the good man was home. His children came around to him, but instead of receiving their embraces with pleasure, he looked on, and holding up the branch he had in his hands, he burst into tears. Here, beauty, said he, take these roses, but you have no idea how much they cost your unhappy father. And then he related his fatal adventure. Immediately, the two eldest set up lamentable outcries and said all manner of ill-natured things to Beauty. Beauty did not cry in front of them. They said to her, Do but see the pride of this little wretch. She would not ask for fine clothes, as we did. But no, truly, little Miss wanted to distinguish herself, so now she will be the death of our poor father, and yet she does not so much as shed a tear. Why should I, answered Beauty, it would be very needless, for my father shall not suffer upon my account. The monster will accept one of his daughters, and I will deliver myself up to all of his fury. I am very happy in thinking that my death will save my father's life, and this will be proof of my tender love for him. No, sister, said her three brothers. That shall not be. We will go find this monster, and we will kill him, or we will perish in the attempt. The merchant said back to them, Do not imagine any such thing, my sons. Beast's power is so great, and I have no hopes of your overcoming him. I am charmed with beauty's kind and generous offer, but I will not yield to it. I am old, and have not long to live, so I will only lose a few years, which I regret for your sakes alone, my dear children. And Beauty said back to him, Indeed, father, you will not go to this palace without me. You cannot hinder me from following you. They could not change her mind, and Beauty still insisted on setting out for the fine palace. Her sisters were delighted in this, for her virtue and amiable qualities made them envious and jealous. The merchant was so afflicted at the thoughts of losing his daughter that he had quite forgot the chest full of gold. But at night, when he retired to rest, no sooner had he shut his chamber door than to his great astonishment he found it by his bedside. He was determined, however, not to tell his children that he had grown rich, because they would have wanted to return to town, and he was resolved not to leave the country. But he trusted Beauty with the secret, and she informed him that two gentlemen had come in his absence and courted her sisters. She begged her father to consent to their marriages and to give them fortunes, for she was so good that she loved them, regardless of their attitudes. These wicked creatures rubbed their eyes with an onion to force some tears when they parted with their sister, but her brothers were really concerned. Beauty was the only one who did not shed tears at parting, because she would not increase their uneasiness. The horse took the direct road to the palace, and towards evening they perceived it illuminated as at first. The horse went of himself into the stable, and the good man and his daughter came into the great hall. They found a table, splendidly served up, and two covers. The merchant had no heart to eat, but Beauty endeavored to appear cheerful, and she sat down to the table, and she helped him. Afterwards, she thought to herself, Beast surely has a mind to fatten me before he eats me. 
He provides such a plentiful entertainment. When they had supped, they heard a great noise, and the merchant, all in tears, bid his poor child farewell, for he thought the beast was coming. Beauty was sadly terrified at his horrid form, but she took courage as well as she could, and the monster, having asked her if she came willingly, she replied yes in a trembling tone. The beast responded, You are very good, and I am greatly obliged to you, honest man. Go your ways tomorrow morning, but never think of returning here again. At this, the monster withdrew. Oh, daughter, said the merchant, embracing beauty, I am almost frightened to death, believe me. But you had better go back, and let me be the one to stay here. No, father, said Beauty in a resolute tone. You will set out tomorrow morning, and leave me to the care and protection of Providence. They went to bed, and thought they should not close their eyes all night, but scarce were they laid down when they fell fast asleep. In Beauty's dream, a fine lady came and said to her, I am content, Beauty, with your good will. This good action of yours, in giving up your own life to save your father's, it shall not go unrewarded. Beauty awoke and told her father this dream, and though it helped to comfort him a little, yet he could not help crying bitterly when he took leave of his dear child. As soon as he was gone, Beauty sat down in the great hall and fell crying likewise. But as she was mistress of a great deal of resolution, she recommended herself to God and resolved not to be uneasy the little time she had left to live, for she firmly believed the beast would eat her up that night. However, she thought she might as well walk around until then and view the fine castle which she could not help admiring. It was a delightful, pleasant place, and she was extremely surprised at seeing a door over which was written, Beauty's Apartment. She opened the door hastily, and was quite dazzled with the magnificence that reigned throughout. But what chiefly took up her attention was a large library, and several music books, and a harpist court. Well, she said to herself, I see they will not let my time hang heavy on my hands for want of amusement. Then she reflected, were I but to stay here a day, there would not have been all of these preparations. This consideration inspired her with fresh courage, and opening the library, she took a book and read these words in letters of gold. Welcome, beauty. Banish fear. You are queen and mistress here. Speak your wishes. Speak your will. Swift obedience meets them still. Alas, said she with a sigh, there is nothing I desire so much as to see my poor father and to know what he is doing. She had no sooner said this when casting her eyes on a great looking glass when to her amazement, she saw her own home, where her father arrived with a very dejected countenance. Her sisters went to meet him, and, notwithstanding their endeavors to appear sorrowful, their joy, felt for having gotten rid of their sister, was visible in every feature. A moment after, everything disappeared. At noon, Beauty found that dinner was ready, and while at the table she was entertained with an excellent concert of music, though without seeing anybody. But at night, as she was going to sit down to supper, she heard the noise Beast made, and she could not help being sadly terrified. Beauty, said the monster, will you give me leave to see you sup? 
That is as you please, replied Beauty. She trembled in fear. No, replied Beast. You alone are mistress here. You need only bid me gone if my presence is troublesome. I will immediately withdraw. But tell me, do you not think me very ugly? Yes, I do, said Beauty, for I cannot tell a lie. But I believe you are a very good-natured monster. So I am, said the monster. And then besides my ugliness, I have no sense. I know very well that I am a poor, silly, stupid creature. Beauty replied, "'Tis no sign of folly to think so, for fools never actually know this. "'Eat then, Beauty,' said the monster, "'and endeavor to amuse yourself in the palace. "'Everything here is yours, and I should be very uneasy if you were not happy.' "'You are very obliging,' answered Beauty. "'I am pleased with your kindness, and when I consider that, your deformity scarce appears. Yes, yes, said the beast. My heart is good, but still I am a monster. Beauty answered, maybe among mankind. There are many that deserve that name more than you, and I prefer you, just as you are to those who under a human form hide a treacherous, corrupt, and ungrateful heart. If I had sense enough, replied the beast, I would make a fine compliment to say thank you, but I am so dull, and I can only say I am greatly obliged to you. Beauty ate a hearty supper, and had almost conquered her dread of the monster, but she had liked to have fainted away when he said to her, Beauty, will you be my wife? She was some time before she durst answer, for she was afraid of making him angry if she refused. At last, however, she said with a tremble, No beast, I will not. Immediately the poor monster began to sigh, and he hissed so frightfully that the whole palace echoed. But Beauty soon recovered from her fright, for Beast said in a mournful voice, then farewell, beauty, and he left the room. He only turned back now and then to look at her as he went out in shame. When beauty was alone, she felt a great deal of compassion for the poor beast. Alas, she said, "'Tis a thousand pities anything so good-natured could be so ugly." Beauty spent three months very contentedly in the palace, Every evening, Beast paid her a visit, and he talked to her during supper, very rationally, with plain, good common sense, but never with what the world calls wit. And Beauty daily discovered some valuable qualifications in the monster, and seeing him often, had so accustomed her to his deformity. Now, far from dreading the time of his visit, she would often look on her watch to see when it would be nine, for the beast never missed coming at that hour. There was but one thing that gave Beauty any concern, which was, on every night, before she went to bed, the monster always asked her if she would be his wife. One day she said to him, Beast, you make me very uneasy. I wish I could consent to marry you, but I am too sincere to make you believe that will ever happen. I shall always esteem you as a friend. Endeavor to be satisfied with this. I must, said the beast, for alas, I know too well my own misfortune. But then I love you with the tenderest affection. However, I ought to think myself happy that you will stay here. Promise me that you will never leave. Beauty blushed at these words. She had seen in her glass that her father had pined himself sick for the loss of her, and she longed to see him again. She answered Beast, I could promise to never leave you entirely, 
but I have so great a desire to see my father, but I shall fret to death. Please don't refuse me that satisfaction. And Beast said to her, I would rather die myself than to give you the least uneasiness. I will send you to your father. You shall remain with him, and poor Beast will die with grief. No, said Beauty, she was weeping now. I love you too well to be the cause of your death. I give you my promise to return in a week. You have shown me that my sisters are married, and my brother is gone to the army. Only let me stay a week with my father, as he is alone. You shall be there tomorrow morning, said the beast. But remember your promise. You need only lay your ring on the table before you go to bed, when you have a mind to come back. Farewell, beauty. Beast sighed, as usual, bidding her good night. And beauty went to bed, very sad at seeing him so afflicted. When she awoke the next morning, she found herself at her father's, and having rang a little bell that was by her bedside, she saw the maid come. The maid gave a loud shriek upon seeing Beauty, after which her father ran upstairs, and he thought he could have died with joy to see his dear daughter again. He held her fast, locked in his arms about a quarter of an hour. As soon as the first transports were over, Beauty began to think of rising, and she was afraid she had no clothes to put on. But the maid told her, that she had just found in the next room a large trunk full of gowns covered with gold and diamonds. Beauty thanked the good beast for his kind care, and she selected the plainest of the dresses, and she intended to make a present of the others for her sisters. She scarce had said so when the trunk disappeared. Her father told her that beast insisted on her keeping them herself, and immediately, both gowns and trunk returned again. Beauty dressed herself, and in the meantime they sent to her sisters, and they hasted thither with their husbands. They were both of them very unhappy. The eldest had married a gentleman, extremely handsome indeed, but so fond of his own person that he was full of nothing but his own dear self and his poor neglected wife. The second had married a man of wit, but he only made use of it to plague and torment everyone around him, his wife most of all. Beauty's sisters were sickened with envy when they saw her dressed like a princess, and she was more beautiful than ever. Nor could all her obliging, affectionate behavior stifle their jealousy. They were ready to burst forth with jealous rage when she told them how happy she was. They went down into the garden to vent it in tears, and she said one to the other, How is our awful sister so much better than us that she could be so much happier? Sister, said the eldest, a thought just strikes my mind. Let us endeavor to detain her above a week and perhaps the silly monster will be so enraged and so angered at her for breaking her word that he will devour her. She will be dead. Right, sister, answered the other. Therefore we must show her as much kindness as possible. After they had taken this resolution, they went up, and they behaved so affectionately to their sister that poor Beauty wept with joy. When the week was expired, they cried and tore their hair, and seemed so sorry to part with her that she promised she would stay a week longer. In the meantime, Beauty could not help reflecting on herself for the uneasiness she was likely to cause poor Beast. She sincerely loved him, and really longed to see him again. The tenth night she spent at her father's, she dreamed she was in the palace garden, and that she saw the beast extended on the grass plot. He seemed to be dying, 
and in a trembling voice, he reproached her for her ingratitude. Beauty was awakened from her sleep, and she burst into tears. Am I not very wicked, said she, to act so unkindly to the beast? He has studied so hard to please me in every little thing. Is it his fault that he is so ugly and has so little sense? He is kind and good, and that is sufficient. Why did I refuse to marry him? I should be happier with the monster than my sisters are with their husbands. It is neither wit nor a fine person in a husband that makes a woman happy, but virtue, sweetness of temper, and genuineness. And Beast has all of these valuable qualifications. It is true. I do not feel the tenderness of affection for him, but I find I have the highest gratitude, the highest esteem and friendship. I will not make him miserable. Were I so ungrateful, I would never forgive myself. Having said this, Beauty put a ring on the table, and then she laid down again. Scarce was she in bed before she fell asleep. And when she waked the next morning, she was overjoyed to find herself once again in Beast's palace, and waited for evening with the utmost impatience. At last, the wished-for hour came. The clock struck nine, yet no Beast appeared. Beauty then feared that she had been the cause of his death. She ran crying and screaming all about the palace, like a widow in despair. After having sought for him everywhere, she recollected her dream, and she flew to the canal in the garden, where she dreamed she saw him. There she found poor Beast stretched out, quite senseless, and she thought he was dead. She threw herself upon him without any fear, but she found his heart beat. She fetched some water from the canal and poured it over his head. Beast opened his eyes, and he said to Beauty, You forgot your promise, and I was so afflicted for having lost you that I resolved to starve myself. But since I have the happiness of seeing you once more, I can die satisfied. No, dear Beast, said Beauty, you must not die. Live and be my husband. From this moment, I give you my hand, and I swear to be none but yours. Alas, I thought I had only a friendship for you, but the grief I now feel convinces me, and I cannot live without you. Beauty scarcely had pronounced these words when she saw the palace sparkle with light. There were fireworks instruments of music. Everything seemed to be sparkling at once, and she could not fix her eyes on one thing. She turned to her dear beast in happiness, and how great was her surprise. Beast had disappeared, and she saw at her feet one of the loveliest princes that her eyes had ever beheld. He returned her thanks for having put an end to the charm under which he had so long resembled a beast. Though this prince was worthy of all of her attention, she could not forbear asking where Beast was. It is I, said the prince. A wicked fairy had condemned me to remain under that shape until a beautiful virgin should consent to marry me. The fairy had taken away my memory of this. There was only you in the world, generous enough to be won by the goodness of my temper, and in offering you my crown. I can't dare to charge the obligations I have to you. Beauty was agreeably surprised, and she gave the charming prince her hand. They went together to the castle. Beauty was overjoyed to find 
in the great hall, her father and his whole family, whom the beautiful lady that appeared to her in her dream had conveyed thither. Beauty, said this lady, come and receive your reward for your choice. You have preferred virtue before either wit or beauty, and you deserve to find the person in whom all these qualifications are united. You are going to be a great queen. I hope the throne will not lessen your virtue or make you forget yourself. As to you, ladies, said the fairy to Beauty's two sisters, I know your hearts and all the malice they contain become two statues, but under this transformation you will still retain your reason. You will stand before your sister's palace gate and be it your punishment to behold her happiness forever. And it will not be in your power to return to your former state until you admit your faults. But I am very afraid that you will always remain statues. Pride, anger, gluttony, idleness, these can be sometimes conquered. But the conversion of a malicious and envious mind kind of a miracle. Immediately the fairy gave a stroke with her wand, and in a moment all that were in the hall were transported into the prince's palace. His subjects received him with such joy. He married Beauty, and they lived together for many years, and in their happiness, because it was founded on virtue, they were complete. The end. This ends our reading of Beauty and the Beast. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams. Good night, my darling.